Hey, man. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Jim Ingersoll here, and I've got another amazing podcast ready for you with a, with a good buddy of mine, Jared Kopp, from the beautiful, windy city of Chicago, Illinois. You are truly going to be inspired today, and you're going to want to go out and, without a doubt, do more deals. You're going to want to be the deal maker after today's show with Jared, for sure. Let me start with this. What is the fastest way to make a relationship better, to make yourself better so that you can give more? It requires an abundance mindset. That's the belief that there's more than enough deals and everything you need for every person that's on, on the uh, listening in today. Because I believe that, I know that the more that I give, the more I will have to give. I started to adopt that attitude years ago when I heard Zig Ziglar say, if you help others get what they want, they will help you get everything that you need in life. And I, I do live my life that way. Try improving yourself and your situation with the purpose of the give, putting yourself in a position to give to others and then just sit back and see what happens. As you give, I guarantee your ability to give more will increase. It will motivate you to give of your thoughts, to give of your time, your assets, your relationship, your influence, and your gifts. Out of the abundance mindset, I work at adding value to people every day. And I ask a lot of questions to discover how I can add better value. And that's why I'm a feedback fanatic. There is no better way to show people value than asking their opinion. That is from John Maxwell, No Limits. I really do like John Maxwell. I've read a lot of books. I've read a bunch of his. Um, but I like that one because it's about giving and getting that mindset right. And my guest today, Jared Cott, is certainly a giver. Jared, welcome to Real Estate Success. Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So um, I've had the pleasure and the honor of knowing you for, for a good while here. And um, let's go back in time a little bit to like when – when you were still working in corporate America, what was that like and, and how did that come to an end? Yeah, so um, I remember it clearly, uh, the good and the bad and everything in between. So um, before I got into real estate, Jim, I spent about 12 to 15 years in uh, commercial insurance. I worked for syndicates of Lloyd's of London. Um, I traveled, I got, I got into the details of, of really underwriting large habitational schedules. And many of these would include apartment buildings, hotels, and, and things of that nature. Uh, very, very corporate, a lot of travel, uh, enjoyed it Re at the time. Uh, I really enjoyed the paychecks and, um, and certainly the security. So I did that for a while, had fun, uh, began to, kind of make some make some moves to position myself at a little bit higher rank and uh my my last move was was in 2011 wow and i knew probably i don't know if it was a week but it was under a month so let's call it let's call it two weeks in that this is not going to end well for me <laughs> I, I felt it i knew it um i had great intentions but uh it just wasn't you know the, the, the culture wasn't a fit for me the business wasn't a fit for me so I did the best I could um, until April, uh, April, February 13th of 2013. My phone rang in, in my office at right around 11 a.m. And uh, the caller ID came up from New York and it said the company's name. And I said, oh, this is interesting. Picked it up. They said, do you know where conference room B is? And I said, I sure do. And they said, there's uh, some folks in there that would like to talk to you. I knew right then <laughs> I was getting fired. I knew it. Uh, so I picked up my, my black portfolio. I walked into conference room B and, uh, there's a bunch of people there and they said, this just isn't working out and, um, we'll pack your stuff and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But Jim, that was, as you know, for me, uh, one of the greatest days of my life. And I, I don't sugarcoat it. I was not laid off. My position wasn't eliminated. I was straight up fired. And I choose to believe that, that that was God stepping into my life at that time i did not have courage and and god had different plans for me um i love so, that yeah and it's uh it, man but there was you know it, it's it's easier now uh, six years uh after not being in you know that just that that feeling of corporate and not being able to own any of your time and you know all the things that come with corporate but um 
you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I didn't have fear, right? I had no experience in real estate. So I, I did know, I was always curious about it, always. But again, you know, given my responsibilities in, in corporate, I didn't have the, yeah, I make excuses. I didn't have the time. I didn't have this. Um, so April, I mean, April 14th or February 14th came and I was like. Valentine's Day. Yeah. That's five years ago, man. Yeah, it was. Um, Congrats. So, we should yes. celebrate your anniversary. That was like five years and a month ago. Yeah, it's awesome. So I knew right then uh, I have no time to waste because I, I like the income that corporate gave me. I just didn't like all the other stuff that came with it. So it's time to get, it's time to learn this stuff. It's time to, I already had the hunger right now. I needed the knowledge. And, and that's, uh, it was, it had to be early March when I was searching around the internet, anything and everything I could find. I mean, day and night was like, podcast, meetings, anything. And I came across you in bank elimination blueprint. My whole mindset shifted. Uh, Cause I knew guys that were still stuck in corporate with money, but I didn't know how to put a JV agreement together. I didn't know how to ask for these things. I didn't know how to run crews. I didn't understand the assets, but that all came in time. But um, man, what it, I believe that uh, we, we were, we, I was meant to, we were meant to cross paths. So I, I think we were, and I can't believe it's been five years since you yeah. found me online. Yeah. That is awesome. Five years. So how did you like start to make that transition? All right, so you're fired, you go through all the emotions of that crap and life sucks, but, but yet you kept moving forward, Jared. And I give you, I, you, you did have a lot of courage to make it through. How did you, okay, so Ben, you came into Bank Elimination Blueprint and then you started, then you just started like buying assets like this, man. Yeah. Yeah, so um, a, a lot of it comes down, <clears throat> um, and I don't think, even though I, I paid the piper and I'll explain to you what that means, uh, I don't know if I would change anything. I, I had a, a 401k of, I think it was like, it was just under 200,000. And I looked at that as, um, I, cause I didn't know, I wasn't in bank elimination. Yeah. I didn't understand it yet. So I knew that I could probably with some simple math and a little bit of luck, I could probably replace part of my income quick. If I were to buy some of these assets on the South side of Chicago, g given the numbers and cap rates at the time of what they were. So I just dove in. I made a lot of mistakes, but um, I worked for a guy for free for six months until I started purchasing. And that was really an eye opener um, because I, <clears throat> I wanted guidance, but I, I've, I realized now I've never really been a book learner. Um, so I needed to see some hands on stuff. What does this stuff really look like? Let, let, me, let me see, touch, feel the experience of this. So that's why I chose to work for a guy for free. And, and it was simple. I met him. I met him at like a, a RIA event and he said, I'm a, I'm an investor and blah, blah, blah. And, and I just kind of gravitated towards him. And I don't know, he, he supposedly had 20 units, but really he was like this side hustle property management thing, which I found mm -hmm. out. But through that, I learned what not to do. Right. I, I would ask like, why are there orange signs on the door that say water is going to be shut off? What does that mean? Right. And, um, it gave me some real life experience on how not to do things very quick. So I realized if I can, if I can create a product that somebody wants to live in, that they would be proud of as a rental, uh, pretty simple, pay the bills and treat them with respect. This has a pretty good shot of working. And when I realized that the common sense behind this, it, it propelled me to, you know, just get in and take action. Cause I, I'm okay with, with failing. I'm not a guy that's, um, I don't have a fear of that. I, I fail every day and I continue. So do to I. I fell forward all the time. So let's go back to your very first one. So now you're unemployed and now you're going to start buying assets. Yeah. How did you find that very first deal? I don't remember if it was some flats or apartments, but I remember some of them. But how did that first yeah. one, how did you find it? How did you fund it? So how the first you, one was from that, from that guy, actually. And yeah. he, goes, he was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like um, the investor is in trouble here. and this just isn't going to work. There was a lot of people like hanging out outside. It was a, it turned into like a, a dope house. There was like, it was just in and out. So I talked to the guy and I said, how much, you know, how much do you think the investor would let this go for? And he goes, Oh, you don't want this. You know, and, 
I said, well, how much? And he's, I don't know if he said 20 or 30, but I, I know what I paid for it. I paid 25,000. <laughs> and it's like buying a used car. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, it was a, a brick two flat, four bedrooms up top, wow. three bedrooms downstairs, uh, just solid brick structure. It, it definitely needed, um, renovation and then you know issues with management on like getting it cleaned out but you know at that time i didn't even have a car i was living downtown i had a, I had a harley davidson so i would go check on these properties so i got to know the people that were kind of squatting in there and i told them hey you know what we're gonna make some changes around here after i made it uh after i got the deal and uh most of them left and then some of them hung around and actually helped them clean out and we've gave them some money but the way that I, I purchased the asset was um, I took it direct, uh, you know, d directly out of my 401k. I didn't know better at that time. Wow. I did that. Uh, <clears throat> so I was in it for, I bought it for 25. I put 30 into it, 30, 35. Um, so round up with closing costs and stuff, you got 40. So it's under 70,000 I'm in this thing for. It's awesome. It me, uh, yeah, it's awesome. I still have it. Um, uh, okay, so we're we got seventy thousand. Couple months to renovate. Couple months to find some tenants. So fast forward, and, and I did them both section eight. It was like twelve hundred and twelve hundred, and all of a sudden there's twenty four hundred bucks. My taxes were two thousand dollars, and I'm like, I got to do this again. <laughs> I walked. I, that was too easy, right? Yeah, like yeah, this is great. So, um, I, I mean, saw, that is outstanding cash flow. Yeah, yeah, there. You know, it's that moment in time that was there, and now it's poof gone. But there's still right. there's still cash flow to be had. Um, just they're not not nearly as chunky from what I'm seeing now. But I walked uh, I walked across the park, wanted to check out this next block, and uh, saw this guy who was sitting on the front porch, and I said. Uh, you from here? He goes, yeah. I said, I'm looking to buy buildings. He said, why don't you buy this one? You want to come <laughs> in and see it? I said, sure. That was a four-unit building, very similar in the numbers. You know, it was on rehab. They were like, I don't know, 12, 15,000 a unit. We put 15 into them. Still have it. It's over 3,500 cash flow. Wow. So that was a spark that got me going. My, my issue came when, uh, when I ran out of money, right? 190,000 doesn't go too far if you're not – if you don't know how to recycle. Mm -hmm. And on the south side of Chicago in 2013, banks aren't <clears throat> nearly what they uh, look like. No, it's hard to get money from a bank. Hard to get money. It was. Yeah, people don't realize if you weren't. It was easy to find the deal and hard to get the funding. Couldn't get any funding. <clears throat> so um, my goal was just to keep acquiring. So I got 10 or 12, ran out of money. Cash flow was great. Um, but I wanted to do it again, so I wanted to kind of recycle. And I called 23 banks, and they all basically said, you're a nice guy. It's not going to happen. Um, Man, so you I, were persistent to call that many banks. That is awesome. Yeah, I just kept going. It was the same story. So I knew, you know, I knew what was going on. But, yeah, I still have all – I have the same assets. I have some of the same tenants. It's um, It's been fantastic. What a journey, huh? It's been yeah, it really has. It's been great. So you love being a landlord in Chicago, don't you? I love it. And you've really helped transform those exact neighborhoods you started in five years ago. Have you seen them improve? Yeah, not not nearly as quickly as I would like. But, right. um, you know, look, these things, you know, when you're into community development and, you know, rehabbing and, and really taking a stake in the how the community does as a whole, you've just got to understand this is life's work. This isn't going to happen. It's a year. mission. It's a mission. And I'm okay with that. And, um but things are, yeah, things are improving. So some people are nervous about investing in areas like South Chicago. And they don't know whether they've got what it takes to do that. But you've always had, a, I think you've had a really good approach to the people in the streets, the people in your housing, and that, hey, they're just people like we are. They put their pants on and go to bed the same way as we do, right? And you've had really good relationships with a bunch of those. Oops, not sure where you went. There you go. Are you back? Yeah, go ahead. We had a little glimpse, a blimp. We have a little uh, technology issue going on here, Jared. 
Can you hear me? I can hear you well. Can you hear okay, me? good. There, we're back. Good. Yeah. So how did you do that? Like, how did you not have fear in the streets? And how did you actually, you know, I always think it's important to treat everybody the same. And I think you do as well. Yeah, I very much agree with that. The, um, the way that I got over it was um, I, just, I just got to know the neighborhoods first. You know, I wanted to... I wanted to be able to drive down at the time, like I said, I had a Harley. So I would get up early on Saturday mornings and just like kind of cruise around and see where people were hanging out. And then later in the day where the parks getting filled was completely abandoned. So we identified some, some areas that, um, you know, I just, I just felt, it felt okay to me, but my risk, my risk tolerance compared to other people's, um, is, is probably much different. You know, um, but again, I'm, I'm on a mission to help change and, uh, you know, create jobs in Chicago and help, you know, re, uh, redevelop areas. So I guess I'm, it's just ingrained in me, you know, I mean, I, I have street smarts. I don't go in certain areas where I know are tough when I don't need to go. But right. at the same time, what I realize is, you know, even in troubled neighborhoods, there's, there's countless of great families. And there is. I think that that was kind of that that filled up my faith more than the fear of the things that uh I like it. Yeah. And then you went out and you created a great company. And so Marblestone came into existence. How did you like yeah. start to create Marblestone as an actual business and a company, not just like a hobby or a side gig? I mean you were like really growing your your business there. How did you create Marblestone? Yeah, great question. So um we were looking to do it as um, we were trying to get a name as like cornerstone or something community. Something. All these names were taken on Google. So are on, uh, you know, the, the LLCs. Yeah. So I just, I wanted for some reason at that moment in time, I wanted something with stone. I thought it'd be strong. It would stand the test of time. And the first thing that I found was marble stone. So that's how the name came. But what really was going on was it was confusing because I had, I had, you know, just call it like, 15 assets at the time and there's a big component of management. So what Marblestone really is, is a management company for a holdings company that we have. Right. And that Marblestone was really the place where we found a lot of value in the community because we'd meet, um, you know, men and women from the neighborhoods that would say, Hey, you know, you're bouncing around here and you're doing a project there. Like, can we, can we help? Can we get in on this? So it, it became kind of a, you know, a, a employment center and then, a, you know, the management company and it had to be separated. And uh, my accountant was the one that first told me and then experience led me quickly to say this, this is a must, you know, this is, this has to happen. So, so Marblestone is your management company, correct? correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, if, if one of our listeners right now is just, just lost his job and he's he's trying to figure out like can he generate cash flow fast enough using a landlord model what advice would you give him yeah i would say get to know get to know a market um preferably one that you can my personal opinion would be get around one that you're local to or you can kind of be around it feel it be ingrained in it um in in network i don't get many of these uh opportunities that, that come to us by like MLS or, you know, just cause we're lucky it's networking. And always, if you, if the new investor were to go to a RIA or meet someone, I try to always end a phone call, email, a new contact. I ask the question, they say, how can I help you? Yeah. It's the best question you can ask. You said that in the beginning of your uh, podcast here, you know, and, and I'm like, this is spot on. This is spot on. I think a lot of times it, when we're new investors, well, we think we might know the answers and we dive in. Ask somebody, how can I help you? You'll find your answers that way. But yeah, definitely know, you know, pick your numbers. Pick, if you can, pick a market and try to dominate that, that market, right? And I, I think some people get lost in the clouds, if you will. Like if you say Atlanta, well, that's a huge market. Dial it in. Right, keep dialing in to an area that works for you, and, and and get to know everything about that. That's that's how I did it. So that's the experience that I can you know share back. 
So looking back over the last five years, <clears throat> would you have done anything different? And like, was, <clears throat> were, you, were you lucky, good, or was it a combination of both? It was everything. It was the timing. It was the grit. It was the failing forward constantly. Yeah. It was the people that um, crossed the path. But, you know, you and I have talked about this at length in person before. It's the daily action. Mm. It's the daily action is. what keeps this all going, right? You may make a one important contact, and you may get that one huge deal that you're chasing, but really what that comes from, if you do it consistently, is that, that daily action, you know, every single day. So I see you've got the Tony Robbins there next to you, and, and I'm remembering back, that's his book, Unshakable, I think, there is. right? Yeah, Unshakable. And uh, so I remember you went to his, his live event, correct? Yeah, sure did. And are you a firewalker? I am. I've, uh, I've firewalked twice, and I'll, I'll plan to do it again, I think, in November in, in Miami. Uh, I went because he was in Chicago. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've watched some of his stuff, and uh, yeah. I said, let me see if this is like a hoax, you know, and what's this all about? <laughs> Man, I, I, I loved it. I, but that's also my personality. I love the, yeah. you know, the high five in and, the, and everything. Uh, Erica, who's my, my business partner. I know. I've known her. Who are listening who don't know. Um, she is, she's the greatest woman uh, in my life. She is and awesome. She's awesome. Today's actually her birthday. So Erica, if you listen, right. happy birthday. Um, but with, with that, our personalities are completely different. Like I want to fire walk. I want to do all these crazy things. I want to buy assets in Chicago. I want to change the whole scene here on the South side. And, and Erica is, is the perfect balance for me. She's super reserved. She tries to poke holes and she does very well in my plans. Um, but if you, you know, if, if any listeners decide to get into partnerships, try not to partner with somebody who has your same personality. Mm. It's a great you tip. Need that balance. You really need the balance. That's a great tip. So when when you went up to the coals to firewalk the very yeah. first time, were you thinking, are they really hot? Well, you know what? And I haven't told you this, and this is yeah. uh, this is hilarious to me. All right. Uh, Eric and I went together. She went first, and <laughs> uh, I couldn't see her face, but I saw her. You know, maintain, and she got through. And I and I and I was like in the zone, and they think they said like say uh, the mantra of cool moss or something so I'm hyping I'm getting there my mindset's right and this guy who's got a mask on it's like one in the morning in Chicago there's 18 inches of hot coals he goes stop and I'm like okay and he took me out of this funk and then they re they like redid the coals they put the barrels so now I'm like well wait a minute I know these things are hot because I'm gonna spark all over the place no so way. I got this super hot coals uh yeah, but it was, you know, God, I, my mind was right, and I walked across, no blisters, amazing, amazing. That first step, were you nervous? Uh, I, you know, I think it was a little bit, but I, I kind of wanted to get, I was, there was excitement, there was fear, and there was certainly, like, looking back, like, I just want to get this done. Yeah. I want to, I want to cross this off my bucket. There's a lot of emotions when you do something like that, and you've really got to learn to, like, pull everything in. I have not done it. That's why I'm asking. Oh, do it, Jimmy. <laughs> Gotta do it. No fear, right? You know what? I'll make a deal with you live on this podcast. <laughs> if you and Cheryl or whomever want to go to a Tony Robbins event, you tell me where and, and I will be there. I will be there and we will fire walk together. You'll like push me into the cold. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't stop and take a selfie. You'll be all right. <laughs> So are, are those, those type of events, they put you into like an environment where you can grow, yeah. correct? masterminds, live events. I mean, talk about some of the things you've done and people you've met along the way. Sure. So great contact through, um, through you, Jim, um, has been um, Gary Harper and his wife, Susan. At, great at folks. And I mean, they're just, they're amazing people and even better, have become better friends. So we've spent a lot of time um, working with them, developing processes and procedures and and things like that and the my um i'm sorry i went off on a tangent we're mindset no, good no you're good i go ahead and talk about like live events some of the people you've met along your journey i i agree gary and his wife are 
So the, re the reason I brought that up was, um, you know, we've traveled to, down to Virginia to see you. We've, we've gone on cruises. Like, to me, those are also events, right? I really look forward yeah. to that. When you go to something like the, the Tony Robbins, it's um, – <clears throat> I made a choice where I was like, I'm just not going to bring my phone in here for the 12 hours and uh i was a little bummed out because i couldn't take a bunch of pictures and post them up on facebook and be like yeah. hey look at me but at the end of the day that was one of the best decisions that i made because i was i was truly in the moment and that's what uh also i think that these these events bring to me is like we need that as as entrepreneurs and um business owners like i think we need like time to decompress on things other than uh, real estate. I know, I, I know that I do, because this can consume me, but I love it, right? So is it wrong? I don't know, but I know that I do need some balance. But when I leave, it's very much like skydiving. I've done that a few times. It's, I, I feel like I can conquer anything. So that what happens is the bar just in, continues to get higher and higher and higher. And um, I believe that we all have it within us to, to set, like, bars that we may not think are possible but sometimes we need some teachings on how to get there yeah we all have self self-imposed limits and you got to learn to to break through your upper level challenges at the same time being being aware of what your blind spots may be but it all requires a huge mind shift um, adjustment because as an employee you never think that way right but as an entrepreneur you you have to do it yourself you don't have anybody I'm holding your feet to the fire, pardon the expression. <laughs> right, <laughs> good one. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important. Um, so I, I really respect the way also that you've really stayed focused on your mission all these years. It's been a long journey for you now, five, six years. And you haven't got wrapped up in flipping. You haven't got wrapped up in all these other strategies, lease options, subject to deals, self-directed IRAs, private lending, whatever. I mean, you, you take the key components that you need to build your portfolio, and that's what you do. Yeah. How do you stay so focused? <clears throat> well, here's the deal. I, uh, I run our business off of traction, the yep. book traction. Um, and I'm a, I am a full on believer of the EOS system. So without going into too much of that, we, we, we know where we want to be in 10 years. Um, we have a three year target. We have a one year target. And we have quarterly goals. And those quarterly goals are, are kept accountable by weekly meetings that I have here with uh, the team. And we all have, we, we all are on the same vision. So <clears throat> as much as I want to go chase squirrels, um, if, it's not, if it's not part of the, the plan, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. it. We stay focused. And, and it's hard because I still want to chase squirrels. But, um, you know, I've been, uh, I haven't purchased – an asset in probably 18 months. And the, the reason that we chose to do that was we wanted to really make sure that our foundation was absolutely rock solid mm -hmm. um, in terms of processes and just everything. We wanted that, that base and, uh, and, we, and we created a nice residual base along the way with these rentals. So it allowed us to kind of slow down a little bit. And, now I, I have, feel like I have this gas in the tank because the foundation is, uh, you know, it's just solid. And we expanded on, um, on, on third party property management and we found a huge need locally for that. Oh yeah. Uh, and that's, that's been outstanding. And we were, we were already doing it for the holdings portfolio and we slowly opened it up and it's been great. So we have, you know, we have two goals, grow the property management company and grow the, the um, you know, the, the cash flow on the rentals. So if somebody's listening right now and they're wondering like, how could I find a great property manager like Jared, wherever I live, what would be a couple of things you would ask a property manager if you needed to go out and find one in another city? Yeah. If I, if I was going to do that, um, I would definitely want to know like <clears throat> how, how long I would ask them a, a, a scenario. Like, you know, I would get into it. What, what, what happens if a, a pipe, you know, if you're on the East coast or Chicago, how do you handle a broken pipe um, when it's negative 40 degrees in Chicago and there you um, go. a 12 unit building? Cause at the end of the day, I don't really care if your rate is eight or 11% or your lease up fee is half month or first month. 
like we can get to that. What I want to know is like, do you really understand the business? Do you understand the people and, and how to get things done? So I would ask like real life scenarios that I've gone through. What would I you was, expect for an answer to that? Uh, space heaters, communication, definitely people on site. I think we, we work really hard and well with technology. One of the things that uh, I think that we are also good at, but I want to continue to improve on <clears throat> is not never losing that boutique -y touch with the tenants, with the tenants. They're, they're, they're our customers. They're the ones that allow us to live the life that we want to live. And I think sometimes people look the other way on that. And it's a little confusing to me when they think that the, the tenants are just tenants. No, they're much more than that. They're much more than that. So yeah, I mean, I look at our tenants as residents and really almost partners um, because they help create the cash flow and equity that we need long term. So I agree with you. And I want tenants that love living in our housing to the point that they don't want to leave like yeah. ever. Yeah, it's perfect. And you do as well. Okay. Okay, Jared, I'm going to respect your time there in Chicago. I'm super excited for you, and I'm really glad you were able to be my guest today. Jim, this was awesome. I, I love catching up. Um, the deal is open. When you want a firewalk, you let me know where to be, and I will be there. Here's okay? the deal. I'm, going to come to, I'm coming to Chicago this summer for awesome. the Go Giver event with Tom Olson in uh, beautiful Gary, Indiana. Awesome. <laughs> so maybe we can connect in person. Um, that would be fantastic. I do need to get there. I think Cheryl's going to come along too, so it should be a lot of fun. But I mean, you're in a great city, and you're really helping reshape that that South Chicago corridor. And I can't imagine what it's going to look like in ten or twenty years with with the impact that you're making. So congratulations. Thank you very much, Jim. Really Jared, appreciate. I want to I want to thank you for being a buddy and and uh, sharing your story. It's very inspiring, and I think a lot of people that are just getting started or maybe just got that call. I've heard it from you and John Mori and so many others over the years. Like, make that the best day of your life as you as you really start to figure out. Like, okay, I don't need corporate America. Screw it. Yep. What do I want to do with my life? And take your own responsibility. Carve out the path that you want. So I really appreciate your sharing that today. And congrats on all your assets and your property management business. It is rocking and rolling, and I'm super excited for you. Thank you, Jim. Keep up the good work. I look forward to seeing you this summer in Chicago. All right, man. Thanks again, Jared. See you later. All right. Bye-bye.